Hi folks, and welcome to Talkin' Baseball. I'm Jason Smith. This is Pete Lincoln. We're changing up the intro today. I get to do it for once. First time ever, I think. So this is Season 5, Episode 3. Thank you all for watching. And our main topic today, continuing with our Mount Rushmore theme, today we're going to talk about the second baseman. So we'll have our top five second baseman a little later on in the show. We have a lot of great stuff to talk about tonight. And we're going to kick off with a quote here. Now, when you watch as many games as we do, <laughs> there are some media people, <coughs> Dave O'Brien, <laughs> who just feel the need to endlessly fill airtime with chatter and banter and just pretty meaningless stuff. Now, the other day, Adam Peller, and who I have no issues with whatsoever, came up with somewhat of an interesting quote. And this is one of those think about it quotes. It might take you a second. He said, the Red Sox have lost two walk-offs this year, both on the road. Think about it. <laughs> That's a no kidding. <laughs> so we thought we'd just let you mull that one over for a second because that's the definitely a no kidding quote. So. You know, one of the things we like most about baseball is it's like chess. You never know what you're going to see to go to a ball game. No two games are alike. This past Tuesday, which was May 14th, uh, my wife and I went to a, a game against Colorado. Now, in order to get decent seats at Fenway, you need to get the seats, uh, I mean, the tickets maybe well, three, four months in advance. So I said, well, we've never seen Colorado at home. We saw them lose in the World Series. But we've never seen them in a home game during the season. So that would probably be a nice game. In the middle of May should be a decent weather so we can see a game in a comfortable situation. Well, May 14th turned out to be one of the most miserable days of the spring. <laughs> It was barely over 38 degrees. Uh, it was misty and foggy, and all the way down, we weren't sure they were even going to play the game. But if you go and they do play the game, you're out the price of the tickets. And it's, of course, with the unbalanced schedule, it's the only time Colorado comes here this year. So they were going to play it kind of hell or high water. Or play it as a day-night doubleheader the next, next day, so we'd have to come down the next day. And the forecast for that was equally bad. So when we got down there, we said, well, usually we go to the park right away because they were giving away bobbleheads again. In fact, this is the one they were giving away. It's a J.D. Martinez home run counter bobblehead with a little counter on here that you can count how many he has. If nine is too difficult for you to figure, then go to ten. <laughs> um, so usually we go right into the park because they only give bobbleheads to the first 10,000 10, people. Yeah. It was cold. It was raining. We were not going right to the ballpark at 530. So we went to Pizzerino Uno and had a decent meal. Got to the ballpark about quarter of seven. And when we got there, I had always wanted to go see the fellow that owns the Red Sox store, a man named Arthur D'Angelo. Terrific character. He's the longest holding, season ticket holding fellow in the, in, the, in the team's record. And he had started out as a kid in the 40s selling papers for two cents outside the park. Built himself up into the industry, which is... The, the store across the way. I finally got a picture taken with him. The man is 98 years old, and he let me wear his World Series ring, which was given to him as, as a season ticket holder. So they started to look up a little bit at that point. <laughs> and if you've ever been to the store, he's doing quite well for himself. The, uh, the revenue in that store is pretty incredible. So we finally got up to the park, sat down, still misty, raining. We brought a uh, blanket to put across our laps so he didn't freeze to death. As did everyone else. The wind was blowing through our ears. And that night, Chris Sale struck out 17 men in seven innings. That's never happened before in 250,000 baseball games. We saw something was absolutely unique. Mm -hmm. The next inning, Workman came in and struck out two more. And then uh, Barnes came in, struck out two more in the ninth inning, which made 21 strikeouts in nine innings, which had only been done once before. Then he struck out the side in the tenth inning, 24 strikeouts by one team in 10 innings. Never happened before. We saw two all-time records. Mm -hmm. You never know what you're going to see. It could have been just a miserable rain-out game after six innings with nothing happening. We saw a spectacular evening after figuring the night was going to be a total washout. And they lost the game, which is really and weird you know when what? you think about it. They almost <laughs> didn't care because right. it was so cool yep, it was. It was to great. see Chris Sale go out there and strike out 17 men in seven innings. Never happened. So he has the great fortune. I was witness to another one when I was 10 years old back in 1986. We've talked about this, and this ties into 
You never know what you're going to get at the park. And it was sort of the same circumstances. It was late April in 86, and it was a miserable, misty night, like in the mid-40s. Yeah. And we debated even going to the game that night because it was one of those, oh, my God, really? Okay, we're going to have to slog in. It's going to be a cold night. And they were against the Mariners, who were a terrible team. But we said, okay, they're going to play the game. Let's go in, see what happens. Well, we ended up back in our favorite seats out in Section 34 you know, back we, then. We were sitting in the bleachers, so we weren't going to give them a lot of money in tickets the way we would have this last week. Right, yeah. yeah. Section 34 is that little corner section that's over by the TV camera in dead center field, which is a great seat if you can get it. Good luck now. They but moved the cameras upstairs. They now. did, yeah. The cameras but, no longer there. Uh, but it, it's a tough seat now, but back then, especially that night, you could go walk in and get that ticket. <laughs> and that night, Roger Clemens, who was just coming into his own, it was his first great season, 1986, won the Cy Young and the MVP, he struck out 20 Mariners that night, which set a record. It's been tied a couple times, including once by himself. Right. But that had never been done before in a major league game. And I want to say the attendance that night was about 12,000, yep. which is hard to fathom for a team that sells out every game now. But if you watch, the, if the game pops up on Nesson every once in a while, the park is only maybe a third full. Maybe gonna, a third. I'm going to put you on the spot. Who else tied 20? Uh, Kerry Wood, right, and Randy Johnson, and and Scherzer, right. Good yes. for you. All right, and Clemens, and Clemens himself. himself. Clemens himself. So, yeah. And if you watch carefully on the Nesson <laughs> replay, here's the thing: Clemens actually was losing most of that game. He gave up a homer to Gorman Thomas in the fourth or fifth inning, I want to yeah. say, and they were losing one to nothing. Because Mike Moore, who actually went on to have some really good years with the A's after he left Seattle, was pitching a phenomenal game. And in the uh, seventh inning, I think it was, or was it the eighth? Seventh. Was seventh seventh, seventh inning. Yep. Dewey Evans hit a three-run homer to dead center field. And if you watch carefully on the Nesson replay, you can see this guy over here to my left go over to try to catch the ball, and the ball falls into the net. There, back then, there was a camera in dead center field, and there was a net next to it to protect the camera. And the ball falls into the net right in front of him. So you can see this guy come racing over. I had and a big red sweatshirt on. <laughs> you see this red blob come over, stand there like this, and then look down in despair. Yeah. So <laughs> had the net not been there, which it's not now, he would have had the homer that won the 20 strikeout game, and it would be in Cooperstown, and we'd be very rich for some of us. I don't think so. I don't think so, no. <laughs> But you never know what you're going to get at the ballpark. I mean, That's we've right. been to a lot of games. We've never seen a no-hitter. Either one of us. Or, but we've seen... Or a triple play. Or a triple play. But I've seen strange things like, of all people, I saw Kevin Millar hitting inside the park home or at, at Fenway. Maybe the slowest runner on the team, but it happened. You know, we've seen great comebacks. We've seen leads blown. We've seen all kinds of crazy things happen. You never know what you're going to get. One of the ones that amused us the most, we saw a walk-off hit in the butt by yeah. Mark Sullivan. Mark Sullivan, Bases yes. were loaded, two outs. <laughs> Mark Sullivan, who has had a career average of 0-16 or something. Something like that. Came up the bat and got hit in the butt. Right in the butt. <laughs> And that we, was the winning run. We laughed all the way home. <laughs> so, I mean, we've seen things like, you know, I, I happened to be at the game in 08 in the playoffs when they were about to lose the series to Tampa Bay and were losing 7 to nothing in the sixth inning and came back and won that game. They lost the series, but they came back from 7 to nothing down in six innings. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen just every except for the no-hitter, we've, yep. we've seen pretty much everything you could ever think of. And, as we said, there are going to be some things that we haven't even thought of that right. will happen when we go you to the park. Know. So you just never know what you're going to see. Yep. It's like chess. No two alike. No two. And that's what makes the game great. You never know. So uh, at this point, I think we'll come uh, across with our trivia question. Yes. Yeah. Everyone knows that Pumpsy Green was the first black player ever to play for the Red Sox. And the Red Sox have been covered in shame because of the fact that they were the last of the original 16 teams to integrate. And Pumpsy Green was not much of a player. They make fun of him for his name. I still don't know why he's called. His real name was Elijah. Yeah, why they call him Pumpsy, I don't know. But our question is, who was the second black player ever signed to play with the Red Sox? Yeah. And you won't have long to think about it. We're going to give the answer early in this show because it ties into something else. So think about it for a couple minutes. I'm sure some of you remember who it was when we say the name. So this next segment is, segment is called, Here's Something We Don't Understand. <laughs> Uh, in April, Jackie Robinson Day was celebrated. All the players wore his number, number 42. Uh, he's celebrated. He's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he's in the American Hall of Fame yes. uh, as one of the first people to be really, in fact, this is even before the Civil Rights Movement in 1947, to break the color line in baseball, mm -hmm. change the whole nature of baseball. 
but he wasn't really integrating all of baseball. He integrated the National Shock League, the only the National League, because he never played in Boston. Mm -hmm. He never played in Detroit. Yeah. He never played in Cleveland. So the person that really integrated the American League was a fellow named Larry Doby. Played for the Indians. Played for the Indians, mm -hmm. and he came up in 1947, uh, the same year that uh, Robinson it was, began. It was about six weeks after Robinson came up, I, I believe. And he faced the same kind of uh, problems with players not acknowledging him and mm -hmm. teams yelling at him and mm -hmm. giving him a hard time. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I, remember, I read a story when he went out to play his first game. He, they put him at first base where he hadn't played a lot. He had to borrow a first baseman's glove, and he actually had to go to the other team to get a first baseman's glove because the Indians' first baseman, I forget his name, wouldn't give him his glove for the game. So it's the same, he integrated half of baseball as much as Robinson did, and yet he gets no recognition, whatever. He's not in the Hall of Fame. In fact, here's his stats, just uh, not to be not to be Dave O'Brien, but just, just the brief, brief stats. Uh, he had a thousand more bats than Robinson did, ex almost exactly the same number of hits, 120 more home runs, uh, 100, uh, 200 more RBIs. He didn't steal as much. They had exactly 983, the same fielding average. Mm -hmm. Robinson played second base. He played the outfield. Mm -hmm. And uh, twice, Doby led the league in homers. He was a World Series champ in 1948. Mm -hmm. And he was a seven-time All-Star and the second black manager yes, he was. ever to play. Yes, he was. Yeah. So although Robinson's career average is higher, and twice he was six years over 300, certainly his credentials as a ball player were equivalent, certainly, to, to Robinson. Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. Uh, just recently, there's been a commemorative stamp issued uh, of Larry Doby, but mm -hmm. only recently did this happen. This is a few years ago. So this this is just a few years ago. If you can see this it, happened, you probably can't see it, yep. but a sheet of Larry Doby stamps came out. Yep. So uh, we dedicate this show to Larry Doby. Larry, Larry Doby. And, and there was you know, some really interesting things about him also. Like a lot of people at the time, he had a distinguished military career, which right. a lot of players a, a, in the 40s did. He also was, I don't know if he was the first, but he was one of the first blacks ever to play in Japan. He played in Japan in the early 60s, mm -hmm. which not a lot of Americans, period, were doing then. But he, uh, he played a couple years in Japan. And uh, interestingly... He is one of the few players who played both in a Negro League and a Major League Baseball World Series. I think there are only four people that ever did that, and he was one of them. Mm -hmm. And he was with the Newark Eagles, which were owned at the time by Effa Manley, who was another baseball pioneer who doesn't get the recognition she deserves. She was not only a, a woman, she was a black woman who owned a baseball team. And if you run that by people, nobody will know who Effa Manley is. Remember our show where we talked about movies way back when, one of our right. very first episodes. If you watch the bingo long Traveling All-Star, she's a character in that movie. Uh, but a lot of people don't know who Effa Manley is either. And mm -hmm. so by right, definitely Hall of Fame person. And also, to show how athletic he was, he played pro basketball in 1948. Yep. He was just a world-class athlete, distinguished military. So, Larry, this show is for you. We, he passed on in... 2002 or 2003, I want to mm -hmm. say. A uh, uh, great all-around player. When we do our next uh, should be in the Hall of Fame show, he'll be included in that because I'm sure we'll go down that road again. So yeah. you'd stop 10 people in the street and ask them who Jackie Robinson is, nine would know. And you ask them who Doby is, nine would not know. It's just uh, being number two, I guess. But yes. he really <laughs> wasn't number two because Robinson was only integrating only one, in one league and the other. So. Yeah. So moving on, so that ties into uh, our trivia question answer, which hopefully you had uh, a few minutes to think about. So after Pumpsy Green, who was the second black ball player for the Red Sox? And interestingly, he came up about a week after Pumpsy Green. Mm -hmm. Pumpsy Green came in, I think the first thing he did was pinch run. <laughs> uh, his career with Boston was, was fairly brief, mm -hmm. and after he left them, I think he went to the Mets. I think he did too. Uh, yeah. And yeah. had not much of a career, but the second person was Earl Wilson. And Earl Wilson went on to quite a distinguished yes. career. Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, the, first, the first black player, the first pitcher uh, the Red Sox had, it was black, and he was the first one in the American League to pitch a no-hitter. Yes, in 1962, he threw a no-hitter for the Red Sox. Yeah, and he was, um, and sadly, uh, he was stuck on those really bad teams of the Red Sox through the early and mid-60s, and he, and he never quite got the uh, 
the uh, kudos that he should have gotten uh, as a pitcher until he had moved on past the Red Sox to the Tigers. Right. Uh, and when he went to the... T actually, this is his lifetime career, uh, record, which is pretty good. 121 wins, 109 losses, 389 ERA, 1,452 strikeouts. Yeah. He was of the Bob Gibson mold. Yes. Big, uh, a yeah. big, lanky guy who would look at you and say, uh, I don't like you. I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to knock you down. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing about him that I will always remember, he's a terrific hitter. Uh, twice he hit pinch hit home runs, and he's fifth all time in home runs by pitchers. Now that includes pitchers that uh, back th that played a lot more than he did back in the early days. Oh, sure. Wes Farrell, a Red Sox pitcher, mm -hmm. had 37 homers. Mm -hmm. Bob Lemon and Warren Spahn each had 35. Mm -hmm. Red Ruffing had 34, and he had 33 home runs. And yeah, and all yeah. of those pitchers above him played way more games That's than right. he did. Way his, more his pitchers. Uh, there was a terrible incident in his life, and it actually turned his life around. In 1966, he and two Red Sox pitchers, Dave Moorhead, who later on pitched a no hitter. Yes, he did. Yeah. And and uh, Dennis Bennett, who was kind of a character, went to a bar in Florida during spring training, and he was refused service. Now, this is still in the height of the civil rights con uh, conflicts in the South. So he went to the Red Sox front office, talked to Dick O'Connell, and explained the incident to him. O'Connell told him to shut his mouth and don't say anything about it. He wanted to hush it up. Mm -hmm. Wilson was uh, not going to do that. No. So he went to the press and told him the story. The story broke. And by May, he was traded to the Tigers. Kicked him off the team. Mm -hmm. Gee, 1967 uh, with the Tigers... He won 20 games. In 1968 with the Tigers, they won the World Series. Think they could have used him on that 67 <laughs> team that went to the World Series? I think so. Now one of, if, like I said, one of the great regrets is that he never got the, uh, the, the kudos that he should have gotten uh, with the Red Sox as he did with the Tigers. Right. And I, I think after the couple, those couple years with the Tigers, didn't he have some arm issues? And, and I think he just kind of burned out from pitching a lot of innings, if I remember Probably. right. He didn't do Probably. a lot after that. But... Uh, Red Sox fans all have heard of Pumpsy Green, who was, uh, had a very slight career just because he was number one. Mm -hmm. So our point, again, is the number two is overlooked. Number two doesn't get, any, uh, doesn't get so the accolades. Larry Dolby and, uh, and Earl, Wilson. Earl Wilson should be far more recognized than they are. So mm -hmm. this is our plug for them. Yes. Well, speaking of number two, we're going to talk about our second baseman. Yeah. So, uh, why don't so, you once again explain to the folks who yes. are behind behind the, the times? If you, we need to catch you up to speed. Yeah. So they're still binging on our early shows. Yes, <laughs> they're, they're not caught up yet up to season five. So we decided to do a Mount Rushmore of the top five players at each position since 1950 because we decided that 1950, as we talked about, that was then baseball was integrated. Uh, the teams had expanded out to the West Coast, so the travel was comparable. So it, it, they can sort of be translated to the modern game. They're on an evil, even playing field uh, with the current players. And you could pick five for every position, and the player had to play the vast majority of his career at that position. And you can only pick five if you add someone and you have to take someone out. So, right. like you said, we were talking about perfect example. When we do center fielders, someday Mike Trout is going to be there, but we're going to have to take out a center fielder in exchange for him. And they have to have at least 10 years in the majors. So we're not going to pick Trout right. you know, down that road. Well, we, we do have a current player on this list, however. The whole point, though, was to, to try to pick players who have played in the modern era when, uh, since we've just been talking about black players, when it was integrated and there was more than just seven teams in a mm -hmm. division and uh, I have to say it again, people that I've seen play. Right. <laughs> uh, I saw Larry Doby play in 1954, and I'll never forget this. He turned around and tore after a ball against the left field wall, ran headfirst into the wall and knocked himself out cold. <laughs> Lay there on the field, everybody said, my God, he killed himself. <laughs> uh, after a few minutes, he revived and went back to play in the game and got a standing ovation. Yeah, there, were, there were not concussion protocols in place <laughs> no, in 1954. No, no. Far a, from he it. He was a tough cookie yes, boy. <laughs> A tough man. So, and it's really cool that you know we have we have think about it almost almost seventy years of players to pick from at this point. So we're not hurting at any of these positions. Right. We're, we, uh, in fact, every time we've come up with more than five worthy candidates, which is the case here too. Well, the factor we uh, took into consider, uh, consideration most 
was the number of games played at that position. Mm -hmm. And we found that there were nine second basemen mm -hmm. that had played 2,000 or more games. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, although there are lots of, uh, oh, lots of players that played second base for a while, and like Rod moved. Carew, for instance. Yeah, Rod Carew was uh, half second base, half first, first base, then he played the outfield. Mm -hmm. So even though he's, uh, while he was playing second base, was wonderful, he, he, didn't, he didn't qualify he didn't because qualify. we're mm -hmm. picking people that are known for that position. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is get 50 players known for each of this, the eight positions and lefty-righty pitchers. Mm -hmm. So here's our second base. One. Yeah, so. Now, uh, we try to make our picks independently <laughs> and then see how we compare. Mm -hmm. And once again, for the second week in a row, we picked the same five, top five, but not in the, not same, in the order. same order. Same yeah. order. And before we hit the top five, I have to say our honorable mention, I hated to leave Lou Whitaker off this list. I think Lou Whitaker is a Hall of Famer, completely overlooked guy. If you watched the, the Tigers in the 80s and 90s, he and Alan Trammell did some dazzling defense in the middle of yeah. the infield. He just quite didn't make the cut, and, I, and so I have to give a notice out to him that, uh, sorry, Lou, I appreciate your career, but you just missed the cut on this list. Yeah, he had the third most games ever played there. Uh, he was usually in the middle infield, he had lots of stolen bases. He was not a big stolen base threat, uh, won three gold gloves, but certainly is, uh, like, I, I had him rated six as well. I, yeah, he's a hall, I think he's a Hall of Famer, but not, not quite up to snuff on, with the rest of our players here. So we had a conflict about number one. Yes, we did. For but the first time ever, I think, But actually. since I'm older, he had to take my choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, I deferred, yes. <laughs> uh, well, actually, neither of us liked his choice as a person. No, I, not as a person, no. <laughs> you might, might clue you in on who it is. Not a person we like, but as a player, you have to give him credit. So, so uh, our number one pick is Roberto Alomar. Played for eight different teams. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, his records overall, he, he had the most gold gloves of any second baseman ever. He had 10 gold gloves. His lifetime average was 300, which is terrific. Exactly 300. Uh, 2,700 hits, 210 home runs, and 474 steals. That's, so he, yes. was, he was the second most steals ever. Yeah, he, he was the ultimate. Uh, he could beat you in any way possible. If you remember, uh, uh, he started out um, with... Uh, who did he start? Oh, with Toronto. And then he went to the Indians and the Orioles. He actually started with the Padres. With the Padres, Padres that's Padres right. Then he that. went to the Blue Jays. Uh, and he was one of these people, he was always with a winner. The Blue Jays were good when that's he right. was with them. The Orioles were good. The Indians were good. And especially those Indians teams that the Red Sox faced in the, in the playoffs and, and lost to, that top of the lineup with Lofton, Vizquel, and Alomar was just Deadly. Yeah. He, those top three guys in that lineup were just brutal. Lofton and Vizquel would get on, and Alomar would knock him in. And speaking of postseason, this is a big reason why he would be number one on the list. He actually hit 313 in the playoffs. Right. He's one of the few players in history who actually hit better in the postseason, so he was clutch. He's a very aggressive player. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very, he was involved in a notorious incident once yes. where uh, he spit at an umpire and was suspended and was uh, pretty much blackballed by baseball for a while. But, you know, they say you have to remember that in the heat of the battle, absolutely. you do things that you, you regret absolutely. later. Absolutely. You know, I almost like to see that because it shows they're playing with a passion. Absolutely. You know, you, absolutely. Watch, you watch pro basketball games sometime and there's, there's so little passion and so little hustle. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm going to take my three-point show and smile at the audience. What? Uh, he, just, he, he cares so much. He was trying so hard. He got called out. And as I recall on the replay, it was a bad call. Oh, it was a terrible call. Terrible it was John Hirschbeck And he the just, umpire. a yeah. Latin American yeah. temperament, you yeah. know, he just, <laughs> he lost it and yeah. Uh, but uh, I think he was long since forgiven for yep. that. In fact, we, uh, last night the the Red Sox were pitching place uh, were against a pitcher called Marcus Stroman, who was very demonstrative out on the mound and was puffing his fist. And I like that. I'm sorry. I think the sport takes and itself a little Chris too Sale seriously. Chris Sale was yelling at yes, him. Yes, he was. <laughs> Which is good. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's good for the sport. Right. Show a little emotion out there. Right. I like the bat flips and I like the the, the pounding and the, and the yelling and, and stuff. And you know what I miss? Managers arguing with yes. umpires about uh, calls. I hate the replay. Uh, my favorite manager ever was Lou Pinella because he would just go ballistic about uh, once or twice a month, and it was so entertaining to watch him do it. Oh, uh, back in the day, Eddie Stanky used to stand on the mound <laughs> and wait for the umpire to come out them because he was short. 
So as the umpire came out, he was taller than the <laughs> umpire, so he could yell at him from a height. <laughs> and he, you know, all the guys like Earl Weaver and Bobby Cox used to be. He, Bobby Cox would flip his hat in the dugout whenever there was a horrible he, call. He, he was thrown out of 160 games. He got the record. <laughs> he does have the he, record. He was thrown out for a season. Yeah, he was. <laughs> he spent a season at home. <laughs> so anyway, but w that's something. Al, you're right. Alomar was definitely a, a, a passionate player. Which hey, that's great in our that's book. Right. So. Right. So, moving on to number two, and this is a difficult pick for us to say because we do not like him as a person. The number two pick was Joe Morgan, which any of you who watched ESPN when he was announcing knows that he may be the worst announcer in baseball history. <laughs> uh, we used to just turn down the volume and put on WEEI and listen to Joe Castiglione instead. And I felt so bad for his, uh, who was his partner? John Miller. Because John Miller was actually a really good announcer. Very good, and he yeah. was stuck with this stuck in the mud guy who, you know, Joe Morgan was always, it was better in my day no matter what. Well, not really, Joe. You need to, you know, kind of, kind of get with the times. But anyway, as a player, Joe Morgan was really, really good. Yeah. So but he had 2,500 career hits now. And this is something that went unnoticed at the time that people would emphasize now. He led the league in walks four times. His on-base percentage was unbelievable. Right. And uh, I couldn't get around the fact that, you know, I couldn't put him lower than this because he won back-to-back -back MVPs in the 70s. He's the only second baseman ever to do that. And he played on a team with All-Stars. He did. Yes, he did. It was the Big Red Machine where they had probably, you could make the case that that team had seven or eight Hall Pete of Famers Rose, on it. Pete Rose, Johnny Bench, my God. Tony Perez was they're, on They're going to show up later in our Yes, they will. Here. Yeah, yes, they will. <laughs> uh, he, he did have five gold gloves, so he was good in the field. Uh, he had... Five straight years where he was in the top ten of MVP voting. That's, that's pretty amazing when you yeah. think about it. As a second baseman, he had 689 steals, by far the most of any second baseman. That's a lot. That's a lot of steals. That's, I, I don't know where he ranks all the time, but I'll bet it's in the top ten. Oh, I, oh, I think so, yeah. too. It's, it's by far the most of the second baseman. And like you said, he was, uh, he was on, um, he's mostly known for the Big Red Machine, although he was with Houston for a while, and then he bounced around at the end of his career. He was actually, I forgot, he was on the 83 Phillies team that made the World Series, right. the Wheeze Kids, yeah. because they were all these older guys. And he actually ended yeah. up in Oakland. He, right? yeah. yeah. See, now that's something Alomar and, uh, and Morgan, you, we should do a show about Hall of Famers who ended up on weird teams to end their career. <laughs> you could win a bar bet. If you said that Morgan ended his career with Oakland and Alomar ended his career with Arizona. And Tom Seaver with the Red Tom Sox. Tom Seaver with the Red Sox. We, we should do a show about that. <laughs> okay. Hall of, where did this Hall of Famer end up? That'll be something for the for the Something for the to look future. forward to in yeah, the fall. Yeah, we'll come folks. up with a good one. Yeah. But Joe Morgan is our number two, as much as we hate to say it. Uh, and, of course, he got the, ga the series winning hit in the 75 series. Say. And he did the stupid thing with his arm like this. But uh, you look at the numbers overall. Yeah. He has to be in. He has to be there in, in the, the seventy-five second, series. He got the hit that beat us the ninth inning. A little bloop flare. Yeah. Oh, off Burton. Of, <laughs> off Burton is only inning he pitched. Yes. Uh, so he's. <laughs> but as much as we hate him, you have to give him credit. So. Well, a little credit. Little, a little bit. <laughs> so we're not going to go overboard. No. Okay. Uh, number three uh, is Ryan Sandberg. Ryan Sandberg is one of the interesting players in that he played with the Cubs for his entire career. He has missed a Cub. Uh, I have a friend who's a Cub fan, and it's his far and away favorite player of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, he had uh, uh, 344 steals also, nine gold gloves, so he's number two. And he was known generally as a nice guy. Yes, he was. There's mm -hmm. no controversy about mm -hmm. him. Uh, never got any quarrels with anybody, no scandals of any sort. Uh, he's a uh, He's sort of the Cal Ripken kind of a ball he's player. Sir, he's, a he clean is. cut, good guy. He is. Yeah. And if you watch, uh, MLB Network will rerun classic games every once in a while. And one of the games that they show quite a bit is a game that features him. There's a game where uh, the Cubs were playing the Cardinals, and he hit two homers and knocked in seven runs in one game. And he hit two homers, one to tie the game in the ninth and one to put them ahead in the tenth inning. And when you watch that game, this is kind of a little aside here. Mm. In that game, the Cardinals, now the, the Cardinals went and, and took an 8-1 to one lead, I believe, in the game. And they had this pitcher named Ralph Citarella, who never won a game in the big league, started for the Cardinals. <laughs> if you watch the game, he goes, and this is how the game has changed since the mid-80s, okay? 
He got through four innings okay. The fifth inning, he gave up two runs to make it 8-3. to three. The bases were loaded, and he miraculously got out of it. And any sane manager nowadays would have said, okay, time, you're good. you got five innings, you got enough for the win, go take a seat. Oh, no, he comes back out for the sixth inning after he's clearly gassed, gives up another hit to Sandberg, which knocks in two more runs, and the Cubs have the big comeback because they left the starter in too long. You would never send a guy out nowadays for a sixth inning after he's completely gassed. So that's another little interesting aside if you ever see that game on MLB Network, how times have changed. But he is, you're right, he's Mr. Cub. Uh, he's the Cubs leader in a ton of categories. He and Ernie Banks are the, yeah. are the two big Cub leaders in, in pretty much every category. And again, I think in Boston it's lost how good he was because back then they didn't play interleague. That's right. So the style. only time you ever saw Sandberg play was the All-Star game. The Cubs only made the playoffs twice, I think, in his career. So you never really got to see him in the playoffs very much. Uh, he, in, in our region, anyway, he kind of gets overlooked. But if you go out to Chicago, he's revered out there. Right. So... So our, uh, our number four, uh, again, someone who was with a team for his whole career, we went with Craig Biggio at number four. Now, Biggio spent his entire career with the Houston Astros, who weren't very good most of the time he was there. Uh, he made a few playoff appearances. They did make one World Series when he was there. Uh, but Biggio was the only second baseman who has 3,000 hits. 3,000 3,060 hits. hits. That's crazy. Uh, he had... 291 homers, but over 400 steals, so another well-rounded offensive player. Yeah. Uh, he won four gold gloves, so he wasn't you know, known for his glove, but he certainly had a, he was a strong second baseman. Sometimes they give that award based on offense as much as defense, but he at least had the reputation of being a good fielder at the time. And this is something to, th to think about, too. He had 668 doubles. Yeah. He's one of the all-time leaders in doubles. So when you figure homers, doubles, steals, and he could beat you in the field, he was just an all-around well, all player that could beat you in any, any way possible. And someone who really went under the Boston radar. Yes. Houston yeah. was in the National League. We mm -hmm. never saw yeah. Houston games. Yeah. They started too late. Yeah. And uh, the teams weren't that good no. for the most part. Uh, it, it, and yeah. so he, he was someone that uh, we just never saw much yeah. of. And he never had, like a lot of, we've talked about this before, he never had a defining moment in his career where you that's look right. back and say, that's right. oh, that's what Craig B. Biggio did, so th I think that holds him back a little bit. I think he gets underrated because he never had this shining moment the way a lot of uh, Hall of Famers do. But he is absolutely one of the great second basemen of, of my lifetime. I got to see him play his entire career. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and well-deserved, and uh, if this is another position, he might be at number two or three. Yeah. But the second basemen are very that, strong here. To have uh, almost 300 home runs and over 400 steals. And uh, that's that's for um, for an infielder, a middle for infielder. An infielder. It's, it's unique for an outfielder. It's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, that's right. An infielder. So for the first time in our 15 picks so mm -hmm. far, we picked uh, for number five a player who is still active, mm -hmm. and that's Robinson Cano. Uh, Robinson Cano, we knew and didn't love too much as a Yankee, <laughs> right. uh, but uh, although he's still playing, he's got a 3.04. Lifetime average, which is terrific. Uh, he's got uh, 314 home runs. The only place where he uh, no, does not match up to middle infielder is steals. Steals. Mm -hmm. Never stole much at all. Never tried to. And that also goes with the era, though. I mean, yeah. stolen bases in the last 20 years are sort right. of faded out of the game. That's so right. that's right. Uh, he played for the Yankees quite a while, and then shockingly, I think to them especially, went to the Mariners to play. Mm -hmm and uh, was involved in a drug suspension of mm -hmm. 80 games, which has certainly tarnished his a situation. Bit, a little bit. And he was just traded to the Mets this year. Mm -hmm. So who knows how his career is going to follow knows? from this yeah. point. The, well, Mets, the Mets currently are having some troubles. Yeah, We're well, talking about even firing the manager right now. Yeah, and he's over 2,500 hits. So of That's all right. the active players that are short of 3,000, he's the most likely to get there, I yeah. think. And other, other than last year, I don't think he ever had an injury until last year. He had the suspension, yeah. but last year, he played every game a couple seasons. He never had an injury till last year. And something, if you're into uh, a little bit of the advanced stats like, uh, like I bring into, there's a stat called OPS Plus, which is your... OPS average in relation to the rest of the league, and 100 is an average and higher than that. He has the highest OPS plus of any second baseman ever. It's 126. Ever. ever. So in relation to the rest of the league, he's the best second baseman of, of our generation, anyway, of, of the current generation. 
Uh, so those are our uh, those are our top five. Uh, feel free to agree, disagree. Like I said, we gave honorable mention to Lou Whitaker. Uh, someone else, you could make an argument for Jeff Kent, who had the most homers of any second baseman he, in history. Jeff Kent is kind of interesting as a second baseman. Far and away the most home runs. 377, RBIs 15, and hit 290. Zero gold gloves. Zero. That's, that that, to me that took him out of the category. I agree. That's 94 I steals, zero. He was strictly an offensive yep, second absolutely. baseman. Absolutely, and a power hitter. Power and, hitting uh, second baseman. Apparently uh, not a nice man. No, there was an incident when he was with the Giants uh, that he and, of all people, he and Barry Bonds got in a disagreement, <laughs> and the team sided with Bonds. Yeah. So that goes to show how disliked Jeff Kent was as a player. He was not a nice guy whatsoever. Uh, the other two that we considered were Willie Randolph, mm -hmm. Played mostly with the Yankees, mm -hmm. and Frank White mostly with Kansas City. Mm -hmm. uh, Randolph had nine gold gloves. White had eight, uh, but White's average is only 255, and Randolph only had 54 home runs. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what we're trying to do is find someone that's excellent on both sides. Well-rounded players. Both sides mm -hmm. of the of batting and, hit, and hitting, mm -hmm. so uh, they were taken out. But they also played uh, at least 3,000 games. Mm -hmm. So those are the nine players we considered for our Mount Rushmore Hall of Fame. So feel free to agree, disagree. Let us know what you think. So Robert, as always, Roberto Alomar is your Joe Morgan. It rolls up here. Ryan Sandberg, Craig Biggio, and, and Robinson, Robinson Cano. Cano. And who knows? Cano is number five. He may move up the list by the time he retires. You yep. never, you never know. Right. And that's what makes this cool. Is that yep. this is a right. fluid list that we're doing? Because we said before, only five. It's not like the Hall of Fame. You keep adding and adding and yeah. adding and adding. If someone is good enough to break this list, someone leaves. Right. Yeah. And that's what makes it tough. So, <laughs> and, and there's no room for sentimentality. We're, no, we're that's very right. numbers-driven people. <laughs> Just like Dave O'Brien. Oh, did and, I? You know what else has been interesting so far? The majority of our picks have been National Leaguers. Yes. It seems it, like the yes, National Leaguers yeah. tend to have mm -hmm. defensive infielders better than we have. And I think, you well, know, part of that is, remember, all through the 70s and 80s, the National League won the All-Star game, what, what was it, 15 out of 16 years or some absurd yeah. number like that? And they took pride in that. The right. National League wanted to go out and beat the American League every year. And I don't know if that ties into that, that they maybe just had some better position players uh, you know, and the American League was more focused on, uh, you know, on maybe an all-around team rather than individuals. Oh, well, the American League also had a DH, so that, that kind of countered. And the then it turned league. around. Yes, then it turned around. All of a sudden, and the, and now the American last League, 20 years, yeah. it's been primarily American League teams, especially when they made the rule that the winner of the All-Star game got to have... Uh, Home field, field advantage, advantage in the World Series. Oh, oh boy, now we're going to reach the play. so stupid. <laughs> Thank God they stopped that. Oh, my God. Yeah, but we always got it. We did. We, always, <laughs> we did always get it. Especially that the Red Sox are making appearances. We always got the home field. So, uh, so moving on to the next one, we, we thought we'd uh, add a little bit of uh, humor into this, uh, into this we show. We just can't here. let the mound visit controversy go. Uh, <laughs> We went down to the game the, the other night, even through the rain, on the scoreboard, remaining mound remaining visits mound four, visits. remaining mound visits three. Uh, this whole attention was to speed up the game. I don't see that it speeded up the game at all. Nothing. It's done nothing to speed up the game whatsoever. So I was curious. This year they limited the mound visits to five, five. instead of six. Yeah. What would happen if they exceeded the mound visits. What are the penalties Pen for doing the penalties? That? And I looked it up and couldn't find any penalties. There aren't any. There couldn't are none written in any book whatsoever. It's just sort of there as a rule. But what happens when you exceed? We so, don't know. So we first of all thought, how could you get around this rule? Oh, there are plenty of ways around. you can so, get around it. So without consulting each other, we've come up with some, I think, very creative, poetic ways mm -hmm. to get around the mound visit rule. Yep. Uh, my first is, we don't meet at the mound. We go to the dugout. Yes. Why the manager, something like Bobby Cox, was, it, was, it was terrible to watch him limp out to the mound. The poor guy he couldn't walk well. So let the pitcher go to the dugout instead sure. and have the talk in there. So our talks will be in the dugout. It's not a mound visit. They don't have rules about dugout visits. No, no. So, okay, that's, that's one way to avoid it. Yeah, that, well, that tied into mine. Mine was, uh, like you said, it, it's only a mound visit. Well, how about a line visit? Everyone meets on the baseline in the middle. Oh, I pitcher, pitcher, the catcher, and the manager all meet on the baseline. Okay, my next sec uh, suggestion was second base. Yeah. All the, you know, all the infielders come in? Sure. Let the pitcher go to all the infielders. Sure, yeah. It's, you're not on the mound, so that, that doesn't count. 
That doesn't count at all. That's not on the mound. But th I think this one it would take a little, uh, a little rehearsal, a little scheduling um, of some special uh, kind of tutoring. I think they should meet at home plate. Now, if they meet at home plate, the catcher is going to hear them. So all the pitchers have to learn Navajo. <laughs> <laughs> because Navajo was used as code in World yes, War II, yeah. so they speak to each other in Navajo, so they won't give anything away. Great and idea. So they don't have to talk like this anymore. Great idea. They can just sort of, you know, <laughs> speak in Navajo. Well, you know, I, I, my, I, you know, you went backwards in time for yours back to World War II. I was forward thinking in one of mine. You know, technology has just invaded every aspect of our lives, and we're coming to you on live television as a great example of that. Now. If you remember Joe Kelly from last year, what, did Joe, what was he most known for other than fighting? He was known for these goggles. Okay, well, why not have the pitchers wear goggles? The technology has come where, you know, you can have the catcher with a little earpiece or a little button thing, and it'll flash on the goggles what the, pitcher, what, what the catcher wants you to throw. I mean, you, know, you have virtual reality. Why not virtual catching? And actually, I mean, in football... They have signals in the helmet. Exactly. Yeah. So why not have it Good in the idea. hats? Good idea. The hats or the go I think the goggles would be great. You just kind of click a button, and what the catcher wants you to do is right there, and cl you click the button, and you, and you proceed with your pitch. Actually, there's been some outcry. The pitchers should be wearing helmets anyway, so they're sure. hit by live yeah, drives. So put the microphone so in there. Right in there. Sure. And you know they can have the little play thing like Tom Brady does. We have no mound visits. No mound visits whatsoever. So single one. Yeah. And single and that's one your penalty. penalty. Okay. So I, I thought another one that would be that would be really good. Uh, again, tying into the whole technology thing, it, you know, and we, we've talked about many times our, our, our dislike for, for Dave O'Brien's rambling. <laughs> Work with him and have him talk in code, and you can have the microphone right into, the, right into your hat. So when Dave O'Brien says, well, this guy went to Purdue, he's six foot two, 185, <laughs> that's a signal to throw a curveball, something <laughs> like that. We have a whole code set up for all these inane ramblings that Dave O'Brien does. That would give him some purpose in the booth. Yeah, he could See? never learn Navajo. He could ne oh, he wouldn't learn Navajo, oh, but if you give him, say, say a college stat for an outside pitch, oh, he'd be all over that. Right. So I think that's, a, that's another way to just get around, because it's a... Mound visit doesn't right. mean you have to be on the mound. There are so many ways you can get around this. Now, what we've never been able to find out is what the penalties are if you do exceed the mound visits. There are none. There don't <laughs> seem there to be none. any. Uh, I said, I suppose they could throw you out of the game, uh, which would be... A little the, extreme, I think. Extreme. <laughs> so we've got a few of those, too. Uh, my first one is, if you exceed the mound visits... For the next batter, the pitcher and catcher have to swap positions. Oh, that's a great one. I like that. So the catcher like has to be off the pitch. I like the that. The pitcher has to catch. That's great. That's a fantastic idea. Okay. Oh, my, mine was a little less extreme. I thought that it would be cool if you, uh, for a penalty, you lose a fielder. For the next at bat, somebody has to leave the field. You can pick whoever it is, but you can only have eight fielders for the next batter as a penalty. So I think that would be a good one, too. Mine's even more extreme. Okay. I think they should remove the mound. <laughs> well, yes, take the mound great away. Great one. So Excellent. Just the, the ground crew comes up. It takes a little more time. Yeah. Just remove the mound, and the pitcher has to throw a flat ground. That's great. So or, it, yeah, or in Toronto, they just deflate the bubble that right. they have under yeah. the mound. Remove yeah. the ground. Just well, put them so there is no more mound, yeah. so you can't have mound visits. Well, I was actually going to suggest that for the next batter, you know, they've talked about moving the, the pitcher's mound back. Great. He has to throw the next batter from 70 feet away instead of 60. I think right. that's a perfect idea. So, you know, and that would be a little uh, sort of uh, test run for moving the mound back like they've been talking about doing. Hey, there you go. That's your chance to try it out right there. I think those are great ideas for penalties. I think our viewers sense that we are making fun of the mound visit rule. Yes, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole idea of the mound <laughs> visit was supposed to save time, right. and it hasn't. And... To be perfectly honest, there were only really one or two catchers who were really abusing that rule anyway. Okay. Now, Gary Sanchez was the big one who he learned from Posada. Posada was the king of the dramatic mound visit. You know, how many times in the playoffs, time, and Posada would trot out and talk to whoever was on the mound. And other than Sanchez, there weren't really a lot of catchers that did it a lot. So no. it just kind of seemed like an overreaction to, instead of going to Sanchez and saying, hey, knock it off, let's go, they penalized everybody in the process. So... I, just, I don't understand the point of it. Well, I never understood the point of having a pitching coach come out anyway. What's he going to tell the guy? Hey, throw strikes. Throw strikes. <laughs> and I've been keeping track. This past season, every time the pitching coach comes out to talk, Dana Levangie comes out, 
guaranteed the next pitch gets hit. Oh, absolutely. Unbelievable. Absolutely. The batters know. know. <laughs> well, like you said, throw strikes. Well, the batter's thinking, oh, this is going to be a meatball. All right, let me get all over this pitch. Last night, interesting, Cora came out. And the reason they gave was he could speak Spanish to yes. Erod. Yes, uh, yes, that's Daniel right. Because Vanjie couldn't talk to him. See, that's this right. when Navajo is going to come in the, well. It's a universal. The, part of your spring training is Navajo classes. You that's know, right. a, a, you know, a, a couple hours a week, just basic Navajo, and uh, and, and it's it, but it has talk, to be secret. And it has to be yes. nobody can know. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yankees will. Oh, that's right. Everyone can have. Every team can have its own language. How about that? <laughs> that would be a great one. And yeah. it has to be something that nobody in the, else in the majors speaks. So, you know, the, or maybe that can be an advantage because Xander Bogart speaks, what, five languages? That's right. Oh, so if you pick Dutch, oh, oh he speaks Dutch. Hey, that's an advantage. You could even try right. Pig Latin. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Pig Latin would be would great. Be great. Yeah. O3, the uh, All Bay. Yeah, that would be, uh, that'd be great. Uh, so. <laughs> well, this, this is just, we're not big fans of Commissioner Manfred, you know. Most no. people are afraid of heights. He's afraid of wits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's afraid of length, actually. <laughs> so, and this, we've talked about this before. If you're a baseball fan, don't you want more baseball? I do. That's I right. want more baseball. Why are you shortening games? I don't understand this at all. Now, the only way you're really going to shorten the games is if you take away advertising time, and that's not going, not to, going happen. to happen. So you're stuck. You Just notice that the advertising brings you everything now? Yes. This, yes, yes. this pitch is brought to you by yes. Toys R Us. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this mound visit is brought to you is. by uh, Halifax and, Long and, and Gone. And uh, the other night, a foul ball came into the booth, and coffee spilled on O'Brien. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Coffee spilled on his copy, and he couldn't read it, so yeah. he's holding it, trying to make out what it says. Whoops, sorry, Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe Dunkin' Donuts could have sponsored that. <laughs> or they're Dunkin's now, I'm they're sorry. Dunkin', Dunkin', Dunkin sponsors this coffee spill. Sponsoring uh, everything. So. But, and, and it's the same advertisers who do the same everything. I've said my son is six years old. One of his favorite pregame routines is the singing fish ad from Legal Seafood. Oh, the singing fish ad is on, and he watches it and sings along. <laughs> and everything is sponsored now. So unless you take away those sponsors, the game is not going to get shorter. And it's money. And as we've talked about, it's a baseball business. is a business. And they're not going to turn down You know, that money. might make an interesting show. Yeah. Talk about some of the commercials of the Red Sox. Oh, If God. the Red Sox pitch a no-hitter between oh, the 1st yeah. of August and the 2nd of August, <laughs> everyone here will get all sorts of furniture free. Oh, God. And some of the ones that they've had in the past were just <laughs> brutal. Oh, my God. How many times, remember back in the 80s, how many times did we sit through the Michelob light ad where uh, Clapton and Winwood were playing? And, and uh, oh, can you believe the size of this Goodyear blimp? The Bob Sullivan, who's now passed it on to his son, who's equally, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know about those ads. Oh, way back, Jim Rice used to hold up a Hormel ham and say, oh, yeah. the little one is bigger. Right. <laughs> oh, and those are the best, the ones when they get the players to do everything. Like, yeah. hi, I'm Dustin Pedroia. They are not thespians. They're <laughs> athletes, okay? They are not, they're not very dynamic when it comes to public speaking. You can speaking. see their eyes reading left yeah, to right. Yeah, I can see the, tele, the, well, the teleprompter. <laughs> so that would be a great show. We could just do one about advertising. In the the, the Maybe we can come up with some clips on YouTube. I'm sure they're out oh, there. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure there are some old ball game oh, clips Got to get there. that guy from, from Sullivan Tire. The Sullivan Tire guy. His hair flying all over the place. With Einstein hair. Sullivan Tire. <laughs> and, and, and the thing is, if you're like us, you channel surf during the ads anyway. Oh, it's an ad. I'm going to change. Uh, I'm going to put on the Yankee game or something else. So when professional channel surfers are complaining about how often the ads pop up, imagine someone who sticks with the game the whole day. I mean, it's uh, oh, we we were getting so we memorized the ads after a while. I know, like I play guitar, and one time my wife came down into the living room and I was playing the Citizens Bank theme on guitar because I'd heard it so often. I figured it out, and she said. Are you really playing that? Yes, I am. I really figured it out. Yeah, Should I'm just I'm leaving you right. I'm just I'm out of here. I can't even stand that. Or the yeah, the citizens pay live tellers on Sunday. You know that one. Or uh, liberty, 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 yeah. liberty. Or my favorite one, and we still use this one. Well, there's a lot, a lot of culture here. Do you remember the Southwest Airlines going to Philly, and that guy came on? It's a baby New York. There's a lot of culture here. That one is not on YouTube. I've looked for that. I don't know why that one's not out there. That was a great. How many times did we hear that guy say that? Yeah, TV commercials, that's great. I think that's a future show. Exactly. When the off-season comes, we will bring you a, a... I don't know, do we have to get rights for that, maybe? I think with 40 seconds, you don't. Okay, oh, good. So just we'll like make... we did have for the movie clips. Okay, so 38-second yeah. ads coming to you uh, from Channel 9. <laughs> I wonder if I can find the one where uh, 
Louis Tiat used to go, hey, you got what big job, big job, big job paint? You remember he's a paint, oh. was a paint ad? <laughs> I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. But everybody liked him, so, yeah. you know. Well, and, and it doesn't just go for TV. There were radio ads that were on for, I mean, right. if you grew up listening to Ken Coleman and Joe Castiglione, Emily Motor Oil was on every half inning. You know, it's always better than it has to be. Emily, that was on for how long? That was on forever. Oh, for you older fans in the 50s, Narragansett Beer always sponsored the team. And it was the Gansett girl. The Gansett Hi, girl. neighbor, have a Gansett. Or Gabba Hansett, as you yeah, say yeah. after a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I can't, uh, Irene Hennessy was the Gansett girl. Mm -hmm. And she was as popular as the girls that they have on now. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, so it, it all comes down to being a business, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So, uh, so we're running a little short on time here, but we did want to talk about one more thing that ties into our second baseman theme. Yeah. Since our last show, the Red Sox have brought up, and at the time it was sort of out of desperation, right. the Red Sox had brought up Michael Chavis, who has taken the league by storm. Now, for him to come up and play second base, Pedroia, Holt, and Nunez all were, all, had to get hurt. were all on the injured list. Right. So they were desperate for someone to come up to play second base. So Michael Chavis has, uh, got thrown into the, into the mix. He's been an absolute revelation at second base so you know, far. It's interesting because... He played, he batted more than anyone else in spring training. This spring training, whether it was wise decision or not, very few veterans played. Mm -hmm. they, I don't think J.D. had 10 at bat. No, I think Sale only had two or three yeah, games. Just, uh, and, yeah. So Chavis had the most. And he, had, at the very start of spring training, he had two or three monster homers. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to our, Dan, uh, Jake's brother, Danny, this guy is going to be good. He says mm -hmm. they'll never give him a shot because there's three guys ahead of him. Well, look what happened. Well, Pedroia <laughs> couldn't play at all, and uh, Nunez has gotten hurt, and Holt kid scratched his eyeball. Yeah. So all of a sudden they're gone, and at this point, now who knows, at this point he's had nine homers, an average of one every ten at bats, which is second in the majors right now. Yeah. And he has the five longest homers of the team this year. He's hit a couple over 450 feet. He, he has more home, uh, more RBIs than all but two players, mm -hmm. and his first game was April 20th. Yeah, that's frightening to think so about. So it's, it's, it's always such an injection of excitement it is. when you bring in a kid that does well. It is. Because usually it takes a while for them to break sure. in. Sure, yeah. You know, when back in the in 75 when Jim Rice and Fred Lee came up as the Gold Dust Twins, oh, man. That's all anyone talked about. <laughs> it, it, not, not just the fact they did well, but the, those two guys, the, the Gold Dust Twins, they have their stats every single mm -hmm. day, what was going on. Mm -hmm. It just gets a, a, a new interest. I, I, I root for him every time he comes up. I know. Right? And what's he going to do? What's the kid? I call him what's the kid. The kid's what's the gonna kid going to do now? Yeah. And he looked cool. He does. Right? And he strikes out his fair share, but who doesn't nowadays? Yeah, every, everybody I, strikes out now. And, he's, he, and he, they, they played him. At, one day they put him at first base, did fine. And he was fine. And he, he doesn't get flustered. No. I've noticed that. He doesn't. He, he, he looks like he learns from his experiences. He'll take an 0 for 4 with a couple of Ks, but it seems like he adjusts very well. And he's had quite a few walks, too. Yes, he has. I mean, he has yeah. these strikeouts, but he does not just swing wildly at everything. No, which some players do, like Devers the last year. This year he's been yeah. terrific, but yeah. Devers in the past, that was a criticism. Oh. He'd swing at everything. Yeah, a lot of kids do that when yeah, they come sure. up. Especially now that that's the thing. That's the thing, just swing at everything from the heels. So uh, uh, that's That, to me, has always been Jackie Bradley's flaw. Mm -hmm. He swings from the heels Every, every single, single pitch. time. Every single and they, time. And uh, so they learned that after a while. He's, he's going to lead the league in grounders to second. I think he's <laughs> setting a record this season for four threes. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We have a thing about we we follow so many games so much. We get uh, sort of little rhythms on certain players. Yeah. Marty Barrett, who was an excellent second baseman in his he day, was. used to fly to right field all the time. All the time. And so when we were scoring the game, instead of writing F9, we have got high for the first time, second I, fly, fly to right to field. Right. Yeah. So that's what we put in, high I fly, yeah. and we only got five of them once. Yeah, I think one time he did, we did get high I fly to right all the way across the So now with Bradley, it was high I ground, high to, second I ground to second base. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, but, uh, who, and who knows? You never know with a rookie. Right. Right. Hey, a few years ago, Will Middlebrooks came and hit the heck out of that's the right. ball for two months, and then the league figured out he couldn't hit a curveball, and yep. he was never the same. I'm a Phil, so you Phil, never know. Phil Plantier. Phil Plantier. Sure. Sam Horn. Yeah. I mean, we, we've had players that have come up and gone nuts for a month or two, and then something happens. But at this point, Chavis has given the team a real right. boost. And so uh, we es hope to see more of him. We especially in his power. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, a lot of the guys come up, like Nomar came out in a great year, mm -hmm. uh, hit 370, but he wasn't hitting the ball 460 feet no. either. No, no. So we got at least somebody who can match the Yankees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So I think, we're, uh, I think we're pretty much up against the clock here for, uh, for this show. 
So uh, thank you all for watching again. As always, give us your feedback. We always want to know uh, how you enjoy the show or any topics you want us to cover. Uh, we're, we're here. We, uh, we give autographs. We, we talk to our fans. So we're very accessible. With, with there's a possibility we'll have bobbleheads on ourselves. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would be great. We could have our little... Sure. Talking baseball bobbleheads. That's, that's in the work. All right. So, so if anybody knows anyone who manufactures these, put in the word for and us. And then our next show, we'll be talking about first baseman. First baseman, which is a going lot to go. more choices to make. Yes. I think we're, uh, we're going to have some, some, uh, some pretty, uh, pretty tough cuts to make on the first baseman. Including a couple players that are still playing. Yes. So that, that'll be cool. Yes. So until then, see you and on. Take care. Thank you for watching another outstanding program provided to you by Lunenburg Public Access. We're here to serve the community. Lunenburg Public Access is always looking for volunteers to help record town events, high school sports, and town meetings. Please consider helping us out today. To contact us, you can call 617-763-3018. Or email us at lunenbergaccess at gmail.com. Thank you.